Has anybody ever tried to do that? <laughs> Might have gone something like that. <laughs> have you ever had, though, an evangelism fail? Yeah, maybe it wasn't skydiving, but it might be something else. In fact, I don't think I would recommend taking someone skydiving and then scaring them with the gospel on the way down, but uh, in today's day and age, many of us recognize that engaging skeptics with the gospel is challenging. And so this morning, I want to help us think a little differently about this, and I, uh, I want to start at an interesting place for many of us, uh, the topic of comic books. I start here because Marvel Comics creator Stan Lee uh, died this week at the age of 95. Now, many of us may not recognize his face, but he was the creative force behind characters you probably recognize, characters like Captain America and Iron Man and the angry Incredible Hulk and, of course, our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Millions of people became, became fascinated with these visual stories portrayed in the print comics. In fact, I still remember back in elementary school, friends voraciously collecting these books. Now, 10 years ago, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was launched so a whole new generation could fall in love with these characters to the tune of 12 billion, with a B, dollars. Wow. Now, confession, on a personal note, I do have to say that I love these stories. And I know I'm not the only one out there. In fact, if you're not aware, Marvel has produced 20 movies, each one interweaving with the other, and each one clearly crushing the box office. And yes, I have seen them all. Even though I didn't read the comic books growing up, I can't get enough of the movies. In fact, I'm the guy who will Google the theories on the next Avengers movie for fun. My wife will tell you that, much to her dismay. Whenever there is the next, the next Marvel movie that comes out, I need to go see it immediately in the theaters because, friends, there is just some movies you have to see in the theaters, right? That's right. And um, if you're wondering, the next movie is Captain Marvel coming out in March. I was almost Iron Man for Halloween. Now, others of us in this room may have never seen a Marvel movie. You're wondering, what the heck is Marvel? Um, or maybe you saw one, and that was enough. Still... You cannot deny that people are drawn to this genre of movie, and the question we should ask is why. Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that comic books and the characters portrayed in them point us to a human fascination, even a human need, for stories. Human beings are narrative creatures. We love a good story. And Stan Lee knew how to tell them. Now, not only were his stories filled with good versus evil, because every character up there has a nemesis, uh, they also explored the character's internal struggles. Marvel Comics, with Stan Lee's influence, knew how to tell a good, compelling story. And so I might ask a personal question at the outset here. Can you tell a good story? Oh, some of us are great storytellers. It is a skill. And I know that because some of us are also bad storytellers. Some of us have the ability to turn a three-minute story into a 20-minute one. The popularity of comic books and their movie counterparts show us there is a human longing for a good story. Why? Well, from a young age, our hearts are captured with imagination. Story speaks to the heart level, or as author John Eldridge said in his book, The Sacred Romance, story is the language of the heart. And telling stories fosters relationships. In fact, think about what you'll be doing this Thursday for Thanksgiving. Yes, you'll probably be sitting there watching football, uh, cheering on a team you don't care about because, you know. And then uh, you'll probably go and you'll eat a bunch of food. You'll eat turkey and cranberry sauce and, and, and uh, sweet potatoes and, and pumpkin pie. Is anybody else getting hungry? Uh, yes, you'll probably do that, but you will also gather with family and friends, and you will tell stories to catch up from life over the past year. Here's my point. Engaging with people's stories is necessary for evangelism in today's world. Knowing the lies of others must be part of our apologetic strategy if we are to reach a younger, more narrative culture. Now, there was a recent article on the Gospel Coalition website entitled, Ask and You Shall Evangelize. And what it discussed was the cultural shift in apologetics. The conclusion they reached was this, the old forms of evangelism and apologetics aren't as effective anymore. In the past, people were, were familiar with uh, the worldview and narratives of the Christian faith, but 
now in this post-Christian world, we, we don't have that luxury anymore. And so around 2014, two Liberty University professors, shout out to any Liberty grads in here, uh, noticed that the traditional apologetics approach of equipping people with facts and figures wasn't working with their students. It just wasn't effective anymore, they found. And so these professors, Joshua Chatra and Mark Allen, wrote a book entitled Apologetics at the Cross. And they detailed these findings. <clears throat> and this was their conclusion. They said, we have to start knowing the difference between information and conversation. So they, they said this, information is good, but apologetics can't just be a dump of information, uh, Josh Tat Chatra said. He said, this isn't how productive conversations work. A good conversationalist, in fact, a good friend, knows how to listen. Of course, we need to speak and make appeals for the gospel, Chatra continues, but, but listening and hearing people out in a culture where people feel like they have to get their points out before you cut them off it can plow the ground for gospel conversations. Now, let me pause. Because he said something here that is so important we can't miss it. He essentially is saying here, in other words, we need to hear people's stories. Uh, careful listening helps us understand a people. Moreover, careful listening helps a Christian understand the worldview of a non-Christian, a skeptic. Knowing people's stories helps us show how the greater story of grace intersects with life. Now, when I was younger, I would often go and I would, I would just go for a day and I would take a trip into New York City and explore. And every time I would go out, I would go and find a parking garage in Hoboken uh, because it was cheaper to park there. And outside this parking garage in Hoboken I would go to was a large mural. And, and if you've been down the main drag, you may have seen it. It's a large mural that simply says, Relationships. And every time I would go there and I'd come outside this, this parking garage, I would look at that mural that said relationships, and I would say, that, that's it. I mean, that is, that is what we need in today's day and age. That's what captures people's hearts. It's relationships. And so due to that reality, we have to recognize these old forms of evangelism are just not as effective today as they once were. What I mean by that is 30 to 50 years ago, what was the primary method of evangelism? Well, you might go and you might have knocked on people's door, doors and you might have made essentially a sales pitch. If you died tonight, would you be sure that you were going to go to heaven? Now, evangelism explosion was effective for a time, but it was predicated on the fact that people would know the Christian story. In fact, even Billy Graham, the great evangelist, recognized change was needed. Towards the end of his ministry, they no longer called the revival meetings crusades for fear that it had bad connotations from the past. They renamed them missions. Friends, what I'm going to suggest today is skeptics want relationships. And so apologetics must be a conversation that engages the whole person. You can make a great argument, but people won't care if you don't engage the heart. So let me acknowledge that today's message again, as Pastor Dave said, is a little different than others. Uh, most weeks we spend time engaging the intellectual arguments for the Christian faith. Today, again, we want to recognize the heart level. And so as such, this message is going to feel a little more practical. Uh, realize that the intellectual arguments are not enough for many people. They need to be engaged at the relational level. And so I want to speak to you today about three keys to what I will simply call relational apologetics, and, and they're this. Develop the art of listening, pursue people with humility, and third, appeal to the imagination. Now, if you do follow along on our outline, I had a last-minute change, and so point three is now point one, and point one is now point three. Three is one, one is three, if you're following along and keeping score at home. Uh, the old ways will not work. We need to adapt to the new ways, and for that, we need prayer. So will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come before you this morning, and we recognize, Lord, that we need your help. Holy Spirit, we need you to guide us. We need you uh, to empower us as we, we speak the message of the gospel to a, a world that does not know you. Father, help us to do that in the context of relationships. Help us to learn this morning more about how to do that from your word, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So point one, develop the art of listening. Develop the art of listening, which again is point three, which is point one. Uh, you can't hear people's stories unless you listen to their hearts. This is where the rubber meets the road when we develop the art of listening. 
This wins people's hearts today. Now, Todd Hunter, who was a pastor and former director for the evangelistic organization Alpha USA, said this. He said, I am willing to bet the farm, I'm willing to bet the farm that in our postmodern Christian society, the most important evangelistic skill is listening. It's listening. Now, I think he hits the nail on the head. The most important part of relational apologetics is developing the art of spiritual conversations, of which listening is a component. Well, thankfully, Mary Schaller and John Crilly wrote a book entitled The Nine Arts of Spiritual Conversation. It's a book worth reading, but I will only mention three of the nine. The first one is noticing. Notice, they say, what God might be doing in the lives of those around you. Do we truly notice people when we talk with them, or do we just treat people like they're annoyances? Secondly, do we pray? When we meet new people, we should pray for them, they say. We should ask how God wants us to bless them. Do we pray for people? And third, they say, it's the art of listening. That listening requires us to show genuine care, interest, and empathy as we interact with others. We do this without offering unsolicited opinions. And Listening is crucial, I think we have to agree, and so that's where I want to camp here for just a few minutes, because the book of James has something very important to say about listening. James writes this. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak. That is, that's the evangelistic tool of our day. However, so often we don't do this. We listen to respond rather than listening to understand. And if that's true, we're not even really listening because we're formulating a response based on what the other person is saying. Or we cut people off. Have you ever answered before you listened? I have. In fact, my wife will tell you there are times when I don't listen well. So she asked me to do something, and I forget. Why? Well, I wasn't listening. My mind was drifting off into other places, and then she confronts me on it, and I'm already mounting an airtight defense, at least in my mind, as to why she was wrong to bring that up. Has anyone else ever had that experience? Yeah, in fact, some of us are not even listening right now. (laughs) Maybe you can turn to the person next to you and say, wake up, pay attention. The reality is I wasn't listening. I wasn't truly present. And then, rather than taking the opportunity to listen, I took another opportunity to speak too quickly. And guess how that affected the relationship? Now, my point is this. The same thing is true with apologetics. Uh, Too often we are quick to speak and slow to listen. And then we start answering questions people really aren't asking. And that kills whatever relational currency we may have. Uh, The famous apologist Francis Schaeffer once suggested this as an apologetics method. What he essentially said was this. He said, if I had an hour to sit down with somebody, I would take 55 minutes and I would listen to what they had to say. I would listen to their stories. I would listen to the arguments they were making. I'd take that 55 minutes. I'd just listen. And then I'd spend the last five minutes trying to speak the truth of the gospel into what they were saying. And I had a more effective way of doing that because I heard their story. I heard where they were coming from. And that's a good word for us. Now, during this series, we have given tools and arguments to defend God's existence. And, and you need to know these things. But, but if we don't listen to where people are coming from or people don't listen to us, it, listen, it won't matter. It doesn't matter. As pop artist Bono said so eloquently, it's hard to listen while you preach. It's hard to listen while you preach, Right? In fact, relational apologetics actually began, I would suggest, with Jesus. He was our model for listening. Well, there are many examples of Jesus listening. An interesting scene occurs in the chapter chapter 5 of Mark's gospel. In this scene, there's crowds gathered around Jesus again after a long day because they know that he does amazing miracles and he tells great stories. In fact, who wouldn't want to be around Jesus? So uh, suddenly, during this whole scene, a man named Jairus comes up to him, and he falls down at Jesus' feet, and he begs him. He says, Lord, my little girl is dying. Can you please come heal her? And, and so immediately what Jesus does is he, he starts walking through the crowds. 
He moves through them to see this sick little girl, and then all of a sudden he senses that someone touched his clothes. Because in the crowd there was a woman who had an illness, and she had been sick her whole life. In fact, the text tells us for 12 years. None of the doctors could figure it out. In fact, every time she went to a doctor, she got sicker. So realizing his power had been drained, Jesus stops and asks, who touched me? And then Mark records this. He says, he says uh, but the woman, knowing that what had happened to him, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, do you catch what's going on in this scene? See, Jesus is on a mission. Like a little girl is dying, right? And so he's making his way through these crowds uh, as fast as he can when suddenly this sick woman trusts that he can heal her. And what does Jesus do? Does Jesus say, you know, ma'am, I'm sorry, listen, I got an appointment, how about you make, talk to my secretary and we'll get you in later. No. Jesus stops, he sees the woman, and he listens. Despite his important assignment, Jesus stopped and listened to a sick, ostracized woman. His care for her went beyond physical healing. He took the time to hear her story, to listen to the whole truth about her. Now, church, that is a picture for us, because how many times have we brushed past people without hearing their whole story? How many times have we misdiagnosed others' problems, that unless we stop and listen, like Jesus, we don't truly hear people's stories, we don't hear the questions behind the questions that are being asked? And so listening, I would say, requires us to put others first, which is actually an act of service, we miss people's stories because often we're thinking about ourselves. And so the Apostle Paul offers a countercultural call to the church in Philippi when he says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Amen. Now, do you see the implications of this? That putting others first requires us to listen. And so a relational apologetic means we put someone else first. Because in our culture, listen, listening is often interpreted as love. It melts skeptical hearts. And recognize this, the reason some people come to don't come to faith is not because our arguments are not good. It's because we don't listen well. And listen, uh, okay, I get it. We live in New Jersey, right? If a stranger comes up to me and starts to talk with me, what's the first thing I'm thinking? What are you trying to sell me? <laughs> like, what do you want from me, right? I go down to the Bridgewater Mall, and I'm walking through the concourses, and they got those little stands, and people are outside there trying to make eye contact with you. And what do they do? They're trying to sell you something. And, and I'm walking down there, and I know some of you are saying, just don't make eye contact. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Stay, stay away. And listen, I get it. I get it. I really do. But our, what I'm, what, our approach to apologetics can't be like a sales pitch. It needs to be in the context of relationship where we truly listen. John Curley puts it this way. He says, listening is a demonstration of respect that communicates worth. Listening is a demonstration of respect that communicates worth. Because to win people's hearts, we have to show them respect. We need to, to show them they have worth. Because all people are made in God's image. And, point, and to point them to salvation, we have to know where they're coming from. So... As you develop relationships, I would suggest three practical things we often forget. Um, and I, what I'd like us to do is remember these three words from, from the book, Nine Arts of Spiritual Conversations. Three words, face, focus, and feelings. Maybe we can say that together. Face, focus, and feelings. So face. Our faces channel emotions, right? They are instruments of nonverbal communication, and they are a tool in the listening process. Always use your face to communicate attention and interest. Good listeners are aware of nonverbal signals. Secondly, focus. Make sure you always have a focus, you are, you are always a focused, attentive listener. Avoid distractions, because people can tell. 
I guarantee you that if you're trying to build a relationship with someone new and you're trying to go deeper, uh, looking at your phone and checking Instagram during the whole conversation is not going to communicate that you're dis not distracted. Good listeners, good listeners focus. Thirdly, feelings. Good listeners are empathetic. As we listen to people's stories, we validate them by letting them know we heard them and empathizing with them. See, when people express pain or emotion, don't try to fix them. Empathy offers others comfort, not pat answers. It tries to understand and even experience the other person's feelings. And doing this, I would suggest, takes us a long way to building the kingdom of God here on earth. Relational apologetics require developing our listening ears to the glory of God. Friends, this is a building block for a relational apologetic. Why? Because as we put others' needs first, we point them to Jesus. But we also must consider our posture in listening, which is extremely important. And so our second point today is this. We need to pursue people with humility. Pursue people with humility. This is actually point two on your outline. One of the main barriers to relational apologetics is a lack of humility. In fact, it's hard to develop a relationship with someone if we act like a smug, uh, know-it-all who's selling the truth to some pagan, right? Yes, I understand that we have the truth, but we also have to remember that we are sinners saved by the grace of God, and there was a time when we were blind. Have we forgotten when we were blind? We should never forget because that reality produces humility in our hearts. Additionally, I would say there's many times we don't evangelize because of our pride, and so maybe we think we're, we're just too good to talk to certain people, or, or somebody else has that gift, they'll do it, or I'm, I'm good with the money, so I'll do that, but I'm not the evangelism. My talents can be used elsewhere. So, so the narrative goes like this, well, someone else will do it. Or maybe, more convicting, uh, we don't want certain people to be saved, because we think they deserve punishment. Church, we should always present the gospel with tears in our eyes because God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Amen. In fact, in his work on Christian, author David Kinnaman shares the story of a skeptic who had many conversations with Christians. And she said, Christians often come across as trying, consciously or unconsciously, to justify feelings of moral and spiritual superiority. And so she described it like this. She said, Christians like to hear themselves talk. They're arrogant about their beliefs, but they never bother figuring out what other people actually think. They don't seem to be very compassionate, especially when they feel strongly about something. Now, that's convicting. How do we engage with those who don't believe? Now, hearing a statement like this naturally makes us defensive, but what I'd like to consider just for a minute this morning is, is would you consider that some of this is true? That, that maybe we're not very compassionate. That maybe we don't ask others what they believe. In fact, we wouldn't be the first to do this. Do you remember the story of the prophet Jonah? Right? How, does his, how did his story begin? Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it. For the evil, their evil has come up before me, God said to Jonah. Now, up until this point in Israel's history, the prophets were only sent to God's people. See, neither Jeremiah nor Isaiah nor Amos were sent to other nations. Jonah's mission here was unprecedented. The Ninevites were not God's people. They were enemies of the people of God, and they were brutal enemies. In fact, if you're not familiar with the history, Nineveh was part of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were known for capturing their enemies and then as they were captives, they would, they, would, they would cut off their legs, they would cut off one arm, and they would leave one arm to shake as they mocked them as they were dying. And they did other things more grotesque than that, which I will not mention. But it, God sends Jonah to these people. How would you like that assignment? <laughs> Needless to say, Jonah was not totally on board with the plan. And so Jonah gets on board a ship, which is going the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. God sends a storm and almost kills everybody on the boat. And so Jonah sacrifices himself, jumps off the boat into the sea, and he's promptly swallowed by a big fish. And in the belly of the fish, Jonah uh, changes his tune. He, he, he prays and he repents, and the fish 
blurts him out onto a beach. And then immediately after he gets out, he goes to Nineveh and he starts preaching God's message. And miraculously, if you know the story, all the people in Nineveh turn and relent and repent and turn to God. Now, was Jonah happy about that? No. Chapter 4, verse 1 says this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, don't miss that. And that the miraculously changed hearts of the people of Nineveh, the text says, displeased Jonah exceedingly. Translation, Jonah didn't actually want these people to be saved. Jonah wanted God's wrath to fall on them. He thought they deserved to die. Have you ever been Jonah? Have you ever felt this way? Maybe you have even prayed the spiteful prayer that Jonah prays next in two, verse 2 and 3. It says, And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? See, don't you see, Jonah's prideful heart is revealed in his prayer. He essentially says this, God, I told you this was going to happen. I knew you would relent, God. You're, God, you're too kind. In other words, God, you didn't have the stomach to do what needed to be done. These people deserve punishment. Their blood needs to be spilt for what they have done. God, how could you save them? And I suspect we may have felt that in our hearts for some people. And God says the same thing to Jonah that he says to us. Do you do well to be angry? Have you forgotten what I did for you? How about you let me be God and you obey you see, Jonah forgot how God saved him from the belly of the fish so quickly. Even after his humility, he was still resistant to the call. He was still judgmental. And so church, I'd ask us this morning, have we forgotten the grace of God in our lives? We forget far too quickly. Let's recognize that in reality, many times, we're judgmental people. We act as if we know more than God. And so when it comes to apologetics, it is far easier to simply get up and make a presentation and put a good argument together. It's far easier to say, here's five reasons to believe the gospel and then, and then walk away. It is far harder. The hard work is in relationship with somebody, answering his or her questions, which requires humility. David Kinnaman suggests that there are six things we should do when engaging in relational apologetics to earn the respect of those who don't believe. First thing he says is this. We need to listen, which we've already covered. Talk less, listen better. That way you can understand the background of people. Secondly, he says, don't label. Using words like lost, pagan, non-believer, not very endearing. Treat people like people. Third, don't be so smart. Like, don't pretend you have the answers if you don't. Just, just simply say you're not sure. And number three, put yourself in their place. Outsiders want you to understand some of the things they have suffered and gone through. They want you to hear their stories. Fifth, be genuine. Don't try to wedge spirituality into every conversation. Just be yourself. And then finally, sixth, be a friend with no other motives. Outsiders say they sometimes get the feeling that Christians have befriended them with the ulterior motive of getting them into church. Because the reality is this, people can sense when we're being deceptive. So let's not act like we know more than God and let's treat people like they are people. Let's develop our listening. Let's pursue people with humility. But finally, let's dig back into that world of stories because our third point I think is a really important one and that's we need to appeal to the imagination. And again, this is point one. <laughs> which is point three. Appeal to the imagination. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor wrote an influential book about a decade ago entitled A Secular Age. And it's a, it's a pretty thick book, very philosophical, not, not easy reading, 
Um, but the book is about the secular world we live in, how it relates to faith, and how we should live. And one point he brings out is that there has been a shift in what he calls the, the social imaginary. Social imaginaries, he says, are different from worldviews, but they're even more important. So Taylor writes this. He says, by social imaginaries, I mean something much broader and deeper than intellectual schemes people may entertain when they think about social reality in a disengaged mode. I am thinking, he writes, rather of ways people imagine their social existence, how they fit together with others, how relationships work. He says, how things go on between them and their fellows, the expectations that are normally met, and the deeper notions and images that underlie these expectations. And he finishes, he says, because my focus is ordinary people, this is often carried in images, stories, and legends. <clears throat> now, I recognize that's a very philosophical quote, uh, but it's important. So, so what, what is he getting at? What is he talking about? What he's saying here is that a worldview which we've been talking about this whole series, is something, is something, is something different than a social imaginary. A worldview is, is things like, well, do you believe in pantheism, right? Do, do you, are, are you a deist? Uh, do, you, do you have a, a naturalistic view of the world? It's all formal and academic. What he means by social imaginary is our unthinking assumptions about the nature of the good life embedded in our commercial brands and sense of self. Now, what does that look like? Well, just pause for a minute here and think about the different marketing schemes that are out there. Think about somebody like, uh, like Apple Computers, right? What is their marketing scheme? We live in an I world, right? And we need to think different. Well, that's an underlying assumption that starts to affect things we do. What about Walt Disney? Walt Disney, listen, Walt Disney is trying to sell us the notion of a happily ever after with everything, right? Walt Disney was the guy that took all those old tales with, with unhappy endings and gave them happy endings, right? They're, they're selling that. How about Abercrombie and Fitch, Victoria's Secret, uh, True Religion? They're, they're all selling more than clothes. They are selling a story that is tacitly embraced by those who wear their products. Social imaginaries are more about the stories we tell in our advertising and movies than the philosophies in a classroom or in a book. And so recognize this, if you're a millennial or Gen Z coming after millennials, you're growing up in a social imaginary world, which has huge implications for how we do apologetics today. In fact, author John Seal wrote an excellent volume entitled The New Copernicans, Millennials and the Survival of the Church. Now, the New Copernicans are what he calls millennials, saying that they're explorers in this new complex world. And if I had to sum up one of his major themes in the book, it's this, that the way we do church often, and the way we do church and the way we communicate is often focused on, on left brain thinking. And what he means by that is we think more like engineers. Uh, we, we have our bullet points and our structure that needs to be followed. And listen, no disrespect to the engineers out there. I love you. We need you. But imagination, he says here, is the work of the right hemisphere of the brain, the creative side. And so millennials are more apt to want to engage in the arts, the creative fields, because they love story. And so John Seale suggests we need an apologetic of the imagination. Great arguments help, but we need to show how it intersects with the larger narrative of life, how it moves the heart. And so let me, let me offer just an illustration for this. My wife loves Disneyland. And when I say loves, I mean she loves Disneyland. Right? I'm Mickey Mouse, Peter Pan, Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mounted, that Fantasia show at the end of the, the night at 1 a.m. It loves it all. For me, Disney owns Marvel. And so I head straight to the section of the park that has the life-size Avengers. But, listen, my point is this. My wife loves Disneyland because she grew up in Southern California, and she went to Disneyland, and that was part of her childhood story. Right? She rode the Peter Pan ride with her dad. She experienced the world of pure imagination when she was young, and it captured her heart. And the whole experience when you walk, listen, have you ever been, the whole experience when you walk in the park, you walk through the gates, and all of a sudden there's this smell of popcorn. They want to make you feel like you're walking into a movie theater, like you're walking into a, to a different world. Because, because why? Disney knows how to push our buttons. Disney knows, and they make a lot of money because they know how to appeal to people's imaginations. They know how to tell a good story, and their stories often call people into something bigger than themselves. I mean, listen, how many, how many young boys wanted to be the prince, 
And how many young girls wanted to be Sleeping Beauty? How many young kids wanted to take a magic carpet ride like Aladdin? Even my daughter is fascinated by the adventures of Sophia the First, whose theme song I cannot get out of my head. Stories capture the heart, and so must our apologetics. And you know who else got this? You know who else used stories? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus knew his audience, and he knew how to speak to them. And people were drawn to Jesus. In fact, listen to his words in Matthew 13, 1 to 3. It, it tells a story about how this, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. <clears throat> and what happened? Great crowds gathered about him. And so he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. Now, a parable is a simple story to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. Now, we learn in this passage that great crowds came to hear him tell a story, and their hearts were captivated by the stories he told. In Luke 15, 1 to 3, Jesus speaks to another group of people. It says this. <clears throat> it says that now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So what did he do? He told them this parable. <clears throat> now, notice that phrase, the Pharisees and scribes grumbled. These people weren't Jesus' greatest supporters. They were against him. And so he tells them not one, he tells them three stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. So Jesus didn't argue with them. He, he went for their hearts and told them a story. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus speaks to another group of people, his followers, who were discouraged, and it says this, <clears throat> He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Do you see a pattern here? That Jesus was a storyteller, I would submit to you, because he knew it was the language of the heart. That Jesus had the corner on the market on social imaginaries before they were even a thing in the 21st century. Jesus' primary method of apologetics was a story. In fact, N.T. Wright comments that, that through parables, Jesus was showing the world a new way of thinking. Jesus' stories, Wright says, uh, invite listeners into a new world and encourage them to make that world their own, to see the ordinary world now on through this lens, within this grid. The struggle to understand a parable is the struggle for a new world to be born. In other words... Jesus' stories pointed to the reality of the kingdom of God on earth. And we should emulate this method. And Charles Taylor offers a clue how to accomplish this. He, he goes on to say that we are living in an age, what he calls an age of authenticity. And what he means by that is that the current cultural narratives have generated an alternative form of spiritual and moral authority. The authority of authenticity. You may implicitly know this. But the practical implications are this. If you share a story of suffering or a struggle or a doubt, it earns you the right to be heard. Not only will you be heard, but you'll be seen as a model, somebody who's authentic and can share, right? When we share our struggles, we are inviting people into our stories and showing ourselves to be empathetic, authentic fellow strugglers who will not pass judgment on others' weaknesses, our familiar forms of apologetics often don't allow for this. Now, please hear me. I am not suggesting that everything we did before in this series is worthless. You need to know it. It's important. What I am suggesting this morning is that we need to wed that together with the relational element. We need to develop relationships with people who don't believe simply because we want relationships with them. In fact, John Seal writes this. He says, The evangelical church specializes in instrumental relationships, using others for our own calculated, even if well-intentioned, ends. Non-members are targets for evangelism, for example, and members are targets for special projects like discipleship programs. We don't really know how to be in a relationship without an agenda. Have you ever done this? I have. And I'm convicted because I think my relationships need to be about two people connecting and sharing their stories. We need better relationships. And when we do that, ironically, it will open doors for the gospel. Amen. Then we can appeal to their imagination by telling the greatest story of all. Because, listen, here's the bottom line. We can't tell our story until we hear their story. We can't tell our story until we hear their story. 
And hearing people's stories allows us to contextualize the message and create a pathway to Jesus Christ. But we can't hear unless we're in a relationship. And we, we won't be in a relationship unless we listen. And our relationship won't grow without humility. And so as we close, I want to come back to uh, Stan Lee. Remember the guy at the beginning? The day after his death, USA Today ran a headline, and it read this. Marvel Man led generations to believe. And that's really interesting. To believe in what? Right? To, to believe the Avengers could save us from global warming? Or political strife? Or division? No. What the article is saying is that Stan Lee understood the power of story. That he understood what it was he understood it was the language of the heart, and he captured people's imaginations and, and hearts. He recognized that we're narrative creatures. He recognized that we as humans are, have faults inside ourselves. He recognized that because of those faults, we need, we long for a hero. But no one in their right mind believes the Incredible Hulk is real. But don't miss this. What Stan Lee shows us is that we have the opportunity to capture people's hearts with a story. Because here's the truth. We are all humans, and we do have faults inside ourselves. We do long for a, we do long for a need a hero. And in our relationships, we can tell the world a story. We can tell the world a better story, a truer story. A story that every human heart longs for. Because we know that one day a hero, a true hero of this story will come. Who will come to make all things right. And in the meantime, we are called to be like him. As the Apostle Paul writes, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and, and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, how beautiful is the name of Jesus how amazing is the story of redemption? And this is why I love working here. In fact, my job title is Pastor of Family Life and Mission. And I have the privilege of equipping people to share the greatest story of all. In fact, it's what I've given my life for. I'd invite the, uh, the worship team to come forward. We have one more song. Yes, I love Marvel stories. But every time I watch one of those movies, I'm reminded of the greater story of redemption found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is stronger than the Hulk, and he's smarter than Iron Man. He is more virtuous than Captain America, and while Spider-Man can swing through tall buildings, Jesus can walk on water and move mountains. Jesus, Jesus is more powerful than all of them. He is the hero we need, and in obedience to the Father's plan, he humbly came from heaven to earth. He chose to be tortured on a cruel cross, an instrument of pain. On the third day, he rose again in victory, showing the world that a new day is here, and one day all things will be made right. Now that is a story worth telling. Amen. Would you join me in telling that story? Because this is the only story that will truly, really capture people's hearts. So let's listen. Let's be humble, and let's appeal to the imagination of people who need to hear this story. Amen?